Um, next up, we have uh, John Dickinson giving us an overview of Swift. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, my name is John Dickinson. I'm the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift, and I have 20 minutes to tell you everything ever wanted to know about Swift. Uh, so I'll do my best on that. Uh, basically, I want to give an overview of um, what it is, the problems that it solves, and then a very high level uh, overview of architecture. Um, I'll talk a little bit uh, tomorrow at the OpenStack MiniConf about uh, contributing to Swift, and then on Thursday, um, hopefully some uh, playing with Swift and looking at some failure scenarios and doing that against a VM and seeing what happens. So the first thing is, what is Swift? Swift started um, back in 2009 at Rackspace as a replacement for the storage engine behind Rackspace's Cloud Files product. Uh, it was a rapidly growing product that uh, was suffering because of scale and just not being able to be operate. Uh, wow, what happens? Sorry about that. Um, it was, it was hard to manage as it was growing very rapidly and it was having some major pain points as it was growing rapidly. So uh, the Rackspace leadership said, we need something better. And so that's when Swift started. This is when I joined Rackspace uh, back in 2009 and um, started uh, working on Swift. It was launched into production at Rackspace in 2010 and then two months later was uh, released open source under the Apache 2 license as part of the OpenStack project along with another project that was contributed by NASA. So since then, since 2010, we've had extremely rapid uh, community growth and um, lots of new contributions, lots of new deployments, and here are some of them. Uh, this was uh, just some things put, I put, pulled together. Uh, these are people that have either publicly announced or talked about deploying Swift clusters or have actually contributed something to uh, the Swift code base. Um, Notice there's a lot of service providers here. Um, that's generally because service providers are in the business of talking about the kind of underlying technology that they're using, especially when you're talking about open systems like OpenStack. Uh, but there are a lot more uh, clusters than this, uh, some of which I find out when anybody else does, and some of which I've, I've heard about behind the scenes. Uh, people who are doing uh, internal-only storage uh, systems for uh, their internal use cases. Um, we originally started uh, when it released with 10 contributors into uh, Swift, when it was originally uh, open sourced, those were basically the 10 developers who had been part of the project while it was still at Rackspace. Since then, uh, we've grown quite a bit. We've had 94 contributors total into, uh, into Swift, so if six of you write a uh, patch, that's great, I can finally say, we've got 100 contributors. Um, the last release, which by the way was just last week, uh, we released uh, Swift 176. We had 24, uh, nope, sorry, 25 individual contributors. Um, based on some uh, questions that came up yesterday, uh, I mean, sorry, this morning as part of the CloudStack talk, um, somebody was asking about the, what's the diversity of the companies that are contributing here? Uh, I just looked through the logs very quickly. Uh, looking at the Git logs, we have 48 unique domain names in the commit logs. And 28 of those are, not 28, one of those is Gmail, and we have at least 28 entries from Gmail alone. So Gmail's the biggest contributor in Swift right now. Um, so uh, anyway, my, uh, my vision for Swift, my vision for Swift uh, long term is that everyone everywhere will use Swift every day, whether they know it or not. And based on just some of these logos, you can see we're already doing some of that. If you pull up an image from Wikipedia, you're pulling it from their internal Swift cluster. Uh, Vimeo's working on uh, Swift clusters to store video. Um, not to mention all of the thousands of customers that people like Rackspace and HP and Dell and other serv service providers have. Um, so this is what we're going towards. I think we're doing a pretty good job uh, so far. We've got a lot of room to go. So overall, Swift is object storage. It's not block storage. It's not a distributed file system. You can't mount it. It's not POSIX compliant. In fact, it relaxes some of the POSIX constraints that would be on a file system in order to achieve massive scale. So Swift was built for scale, and it's optimized for durability, it's a storage system, um, availability, and concurrency. 
So let's cover each of those in turn. First is it's built for scale. Uh, the design, which we'll go over in just a, just a minute, is that there is no single point of failure in the entire system. There's not a central metadata layer that has to be queried. Um, any single part of Swift can fall over and you're just fine. Um, it's got a very modular design and each of these uh, pieces of Swift can be scaled horizontally as, as you need. Uh, if you need to add more space, uh, great, add more space. If you need to add more front end capacity for uh, networking or connections, you can do that as well. Swift is durable, which really shouldn't need to be said because it's a storage system and that's, what, that's kind of the table stakes right there. Uh, but we achieve this um, uh, by using full replicas of the objects. So by default, although it is configurable on a per cluster basis, uh, Swift stores three replicas of your data in it. And it's more than just, hey, let's copy three replicas. It's actually a little smart about this and uh, is able to place each of these replicas onto distinct machines and if you have it uh, even into distinct availability zones. Why does it keep doing that? I apologize. Um, we have active auditing and, uh, and consistency checks within the system uh, so that in the background things are going to ensure that your data is not only there but is correct. Uh, you don't have to worry about bit rot, you don't have to worry about uh, drives failing, things like that that are common in storage systems. And if there is an error, uh, the entire cluster will participate in the recovery of that error and so that you have a lower mean time to recovery uh, than, than otherwise because the entire uh, cluster is, is uh, participating. Swift is uh, available. Uh, and if you know the CAP theorem, uh, we sacrifice consistency for available. It's an eventually consistent system. So normally you want everything to be consistent. And if there are no errors, Swift will give you 100% consistency. But in the face of errors, say for example, a, a hard drive has failed or a server is down or even a rack of servers is down, uh, in that case, uh, you may fall into an eventual consistency window and uh, uh, not, for example, be able to see all of your objects in, a, in an object listing immediately. But that being said, um, there are protections against crazy things happening. So for example, uh, when you, if you have three replicas in your cluster, uh, Swift will ensure that two of them are successfully flushed to disk before the customer, or the client, will get a success back. So you know that your data is written. Uh, if, if Swift gives you a successful response, you know that it's been written uh, successfully to disk. It uses quorums for this so that a majority of your storage nodes had to successfully do the operation before you get that back. And we offer a uh, per request flag uh, on reads that if you need to, you can get the most recent data uh, regardless of your current uh, consistency window. Uh, you can say, give me this object, oh, but query all of the servers and make sure you give me the absolute newest one that you have in the cluster. And, and that's possible. The other thing I mentioned is that uh, Swift is optimized for concurrency. And by this, uh, I mean that Swift was not written so that you can uh, throw a bunch of, uh, you can optimize a single stream uh, and serve that up as quickly as possible. Rather, it's, um, it's built so that you can have 10,000 streams at once or more, however, you, however many you need. And um, this comes out of um, what this lends itself to, looking at the use cases. Uh, so if we're looking at optimizing across many, many con uh, clusters, what are kind of some examples of how that will work? Generally, Swift is going to be good for any sort of data that is unstructured and can grow without bound. So user data, um, things where you're storing a little piece of information about users or you have user generated data, say your users are uploading, uploading images or uh, any sort of other content. Maybe you have a uh, small settings file or something about uh, every single user. Something that's just going to stick there that you don't have to uh, uh, worry about but needs to be very available uh, and in aggregate can grow extremely large, both in the number of the cardinality of your uh, number of objects, but also in the aggregate total usage of your uh, storage space needed. Another great use case for Swift are uh, things like web content. You're serving images, which obviously if it's the internet, it means you're serving cat pictures, right? And so uh, 
Swift is going to be great for this sort of thing. I used the example of, um, of Wikipedia earlier with their cluster. Um, it's, uh, Swift is really good at storing and serving static web content like uh, static HTML files, JavaScript, CSS, images, videos, uh, things like that. And because Swift is simply using HTTP there's, uh, and a REST interface, it means that it works extremely well with, uh, with things uh, like, like caching layers and uh, CDNs and stuff like that. So when you're looking at web content, you get an access pattern um, that looks kind of like this. You've got some really, really hot content and then a whole bunch of content that is not quite as accessed quite as often. And so, say in Wikipedia, if you look at the uh, front page content versus, say, the images served off of the article on B plus trees, as much as we would like to think that here, it's probably not the most popular article on Wikipedia. Um, so because all of this data has to be available, um, you've got this aggregate concurrent usage. I'm sorry about that. Um, the aggregate concurrent usage ends up being um, long tail and um, is, Swift is good at that. Uh, other examples of this would be things like uh, looking at bank records. Um, how come you can't go to your bank's website and pull up a statement from three years ago? It's not because they don't have that, it's because it's been archived off on tape somewhere and it's in a warehouse across town. Um, or if you're looking at scientific data, something that uh, you've got a uh, set of data that is very large and is literally impossible to recreate because it involves, I don't know, crashing something into a saddle, into an asteroid or something like that. Um, but at the same time, you have to have this data uh, available for a long period of time. You need a, a, a storage system that can uh, reliably st store this kind of long tail access pattern. Another use case that uh, Swift is very good at is uh, mobile content. And the difference with mobile content as opposed to just generally web content is the fact that there are billions of mobile devices all over the world. And so you generally have to deal with an extremely high amount of concurrency. Uh, so, for example, uh, maybe you think that uh, mobile gaming is going to be the next hot thing and uh, you need to store avatars or, you know, how many little trinkets your users have or something like that. You need to store this data on a per user basis. This is kind of this uh, highly concurrent per user information that uh, Swift is really great at. So, we've seen kind of the overall use cases. Um, so how does it do this? Looking at the... Uh, the overview, very high level overview of the architecture. There are four basic parts of Swift. Looking here, here's an example of a UR. Every, um, I mentioned that Swift has a REST API, so every, um, every object in Swift is uniquely addressable by a URI. And here's an example of one. The prefix here you've got up to the slash v1 uh, is simply just the domain name and saying, hey, we've got v1 of the API. And then you've got three parts here. You've got the account, the container, and the object. Swift is very conceptually similar to something like Amazon's S3. Uh, and so you've got some of these same concepts here. You've got the account at the top layer, which is a, um, a segment of the overall namespace that's allocated for one particular user. You've got containers within that, which is similar to Amazon's uh, buckets. And that is a per user namespace slice. And then everything else is the object. The first part here is the proxy, uh, the first of the major four parts here is the proxy server. The proxy server is what implements the API. So basically that first part of that URL. Uh, the, the proxy server is what talks to the client and what coordinates responses and uh, requests and responses uh, to and from the backend storage servers. The next piece are, whoops, there we go. The next piece uh, would be the account server. The account server is uh, what is responsible for the accounts layer, and it contains a listing of all of the containers and a little bit of metadata associated with that, say the aggregate total bytes used, the aggregate total um, objects, things like that. The containers will, are very similar and store uh, some uh, aggregated metadata and also listing of the objects inside of them. And then the object server is what stores the actual data on disk. But in reality, you're going to have many of these in each in a Swift cluster, and then you can scale those out as you need to. 
going very quickly on uh, the next piece, um, we've got uh, the ring within Swift. Um, Swift uses uh, consistent hashing and with some enhancements on that. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over a little of this. Uh, but the basic concept here is consistent hashing. A request comes in, you figure out where it lives based on the hash of something. Um, you make it a little bit better by adding more virtual nodes. I can answer questions on this in just a little bit. Um, and then what Swift has done is takes um, a, uh, divides the overall namespace that the key space that is used into equal, equally sized chunks. And this allows us to simply hash the name of an object, take the first few prefix uh, bits off of that, and then do a direct lookup and figure out what, uh, what partition of the overall key space we need to, and then we know exactly what, um, what storage nodes those are mapped to. This mapping of the key space to the storage nodes is the Swift ring. Um, Swift does uh, some very nice things about being able to make sure that you have uh, your, um, your, your mapping is uh, to, your replicas are gonna be in distinct availability zones. Um, so that uh, you can suffer, say, uh, a failure of a particular rack or a DC room or, you know, a certain power supplier. Um, the, ne the final thing about Swift uh, that I wanted to mention is that we've got active integrity checking uh, on the back end. Uh, we, make, we keep checksums of all of the data. We compare that, um, that checksum with what's stored every time the data is read off of disk uh, to ensure that there has been no bit rot. Um, we continually the drives uh, to make sure that there is no file system corruption or bit rot on that kind of thing. Um, we've got replication running in the back end. Uh, we do active checks on making sure that your drives are still mounted, that uh, they're still valid, they're not throwing errors. And all of this works together then um, to provide you a very highly available and reliable system. And if you want to see more of these things in action, come to my talk on Thursday. So if you have any questions, um, I'm going to be giving another mini-conference uh, talk, uh, Swift for New Contributors, tomorrow uh, in the OpenStack mini-conf. And then on Thursday, uh, we've got Playing with Swift uh, to talk about some of the failure modes. If you, um, I work for SwiftStack. Uh, we provide uh, tools to help you run Swift clusters. Uh, we've got a lot of information about Swift on our website as well. If you want to look at uh, some of the docs, swift.openstack.org, and the code is hosted on GitHub. Questions? Yeah, so what's the minimum, so what's the minimum number of physical nodes to actually run a, you know, a real, I know you guys like probably are part of the open stack, you know, dev stack or whatever they've got, but for an actual production, what's sure. the minimal number? Um, I would recommend that you would have at least two so you could suffer the loss of one of them. But uh, let's, if you look at nodes as servers rather than hard drives, um, you could run with just one server with multiple hard drives in it. You're going to want your replicas to be on distinct physical drives. So if you have at least two, then you're protected against at least one drive failure. Um, but the more, the better. Yes. And in that case, you're going to, yeah, it's going to kind of fake and say you've got three when really you've just got two. But the, uh, that's kind of a weird edge case. If you've got three hard drives, you're going to have three full replicas of your data. So follow on a related question. You said there's four key parts. There's the proxy and then the three other server or the three other services. The sure. Proxy, account, container, object. So do we like in production, do we expect that each of those to be um, like a like a physical or virtual machine, or do we sort of bundle these as one thing? Or? They do, they you can deploy that either way. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes many deployments will run all of these on one box and then you can have different uh, you can have many of those boxes kind of all in one, uh, sharing responsibility, that's completely okay. Um, larger deployments generally end up optimizing some of those and have a separate proxy layer behind a load balancer um, combined with uh, some sort of segmented uh, storage nodes, uh, say maybe account and container deployed one way and the object servers deployed another way. Um, it really depends on how many SKUs you can get away with buying and what your, what your actual needs are. For example, Rackspace's use case um, with a public storage provider is going to look very, very different than a bank or a Wikipedia or anything like that. So you can really tune it to what your needs are. Quick question. Any plans to implement uh, nested containers? Nested containers are not supported. Uh, it's a very flat namespace. Uh, you have accounts at the top, containers underneath that, and anything under that is objects. 
But you notice everything was separated with a slash. You can have pseudo nested directories and kind of simulated directory structure, but it's not a first level concept within the uh, API. Yeah, what uh, languages does Swift have bindings for and do you support Bo um, Boto in some way? So that is a great question. Um, Swift is written completely in Python. It has language bindings uh, that I know of for Python, Ruby, PHP, Java, C Sharp, R, and maybe one more that I know of. Um, and the, what was the last part? Boto. Boto. Um, Swift, there is a community supported um, S, uh, Swift 3 uh, middleware that you can run that provides a uh, somewhat of, of mapping between the S3 API and Swift. Um, it's really intended to be a, um, something that you use for migration purposes. We really wanna, uh, want you to use the first level, the, the Swift API over uh, S3's <coughs> API for various reasons. Um, so, yeah. yeah, at the other end of things, what does a typical large scale deployment of this look like? Do you have this you know, in one well-connected cluster and then another one somewhere else around the world? Do you have uh, lots of, if you sort of lots of objects, do you have to blow out the, um, the, the object servers or something? How does, how, what does that scale up? That no, that's, that's a great question. So as of today, right now, each Swift cluster is going to be practically limited to probably a metro area. And it can scale extremely large. So um, I know that Rackspace is running you know, many, many petabytes, many, many billions of objects within their cluster. And so that is deployed in such a way that they've kind of segmented out uh, you know, proxy layers versus storage layers so they can optimize how many requests and the, the external networking that they need um, based on the actual hard drive capacity that they need on the back end. Um, and so that'll be deployed um, according to their, uh, their needs um, based on their availability zones that they have set up in their data centers and things like that. But that being said, right now, uh, there are people, including at SwiftStack, uh, working on uh, supporting global clusters so that you can have one logical Swift cluster um, that is distributed uh, in basically a high latency environment, which essentially means transcontinents, you know, around the world uh, deployments. So it's being actively worked on. Question in regards to uh, hardware setup for Swift to achieve best performance, and in particular, I'm wondering about the core to disk ratio. Yes. What would you recommend? What what baseline would you recommend? <laughs> I have no idea. It depends on your data needs. Um, and that's that. Uh, not to be flippant, though. The um, the reality is you need to match that based on your particular deployment. So it may be that you just kind of have a general purpose thing you need to support most use cases pretty well. Um, and then you may end up with something, this is, I don't know, uh, one proxy server to, I don't know, 30 object servers. I, I don't know, it, it kind of depends and based on your hardware platform, based on your actual data use case. Um, that is a question that comes up quite a bit. Um, actually our company has to answer that for people quite a bit. And we have to do a lot of discovery on, okay, well, how are you gonna use this? Nobody knows your data better than you. And so I've gotta ask you actually, you know, are you looking at a lot of hot content? Are you looking at a lot of cold content? Something in the middle? Um, those things all play in. And the general answer is, you can adjust your deployments based on what you need. Okay, thank you. Sorry for not a specific number, I, there isn't one. We're, we're actually just about out of time, but I've got, there's like three questions in my, in my mental buffer here, and there's one okay. here and one here and one down there. So if you can take that, ask the question, ask the question, ask the Okay. So, so unless this has changed quite recently, uh, I don't think um, object level ACLs were uh, supported. Is that uh, on the roadmap? In ACL support is, uh, is somewhat specific to the auth system that you're using, which is quite pluggable within the system. Generally, we try to keep things stored, uh, things like that grouped on the container level, so that you have container level ACLs. Reason being, um, it's a lot easier to scale, you know, 
several hundred thousand containers rather than several billion objects. And just this, the overhead metadata is, gets large when you're dealing with that. Uh, so normally it's done, uh, all the auth systems that I know about implement that on a per container basis. I don't know if they are planning on changing that. I'm not planning on writing, in, writing that for any of them. Can I, can I, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, sure. Cool. I'm sorry, what's that? Um, Do you recommend the rate for um, resiliency or so the question is, do I recommend RAID for anything? And the answer is no. Do not use RAID with Swift um, in, in general. Um, RAID 5, uh, Swift will manage where the clusters work, uh, where the replicas are placed on the different drives. Um, it turns out that when you have large RAID volumes trying to back on these things, this is something we did when I was at Rackspace, it's, it's pretty horrible because Swift does a lot, lots of small random reads and writes based on the active consistency and the, whatever load you have on it which is pretty horrible for RAID 5 and 6. And also when you get large RAID volumes, the recovery time on those is really, really bad and the performance just tanks. Um, so put up some JBODs and, and that's it. So similar to that, is there any data consistency and redundancy options other than just full copies? No, uh, you can set the re replica count on a per cluster basis, uh, but no, that is not, uh, there's not another way to ensure the, you can't say, hey, on this set of data, I'm going to do something else, or I'm going to choose to use erasure encoding over here, or something like that. Parity inside Swift rather than parity underneath. Right, correct. Okay. Sir, for you? When are you going to align your release schedule with the rest yeah, of OpenStack? Do you want, um, that is a great question. There, we, are, we are completely aligned with the rest of OpenStack. Like the OpenStack release schedule yeah, is yeah, every six months. Yeah, yeah. And the OpenStack project says that within that six months, uh, the projects are free to choose the release schedule that we do. Um, Swift chooses to release historically about every six weeks, and every release that we do is production ready. You can upgrade uh, your cluster live um, with no downtime for your clients. Happens all the time for some of these public deployments. Um, and then we participate in the combined OpenStack release every time that happens. Um, we're going to have to um, uh, stop there. Sorry. I'll be happy to answer other questions and also at the other talks this week. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you.